device presents the premier audio and video experience. Whether you're into high performance audio, home theater, two channel, turntables, or headphones, Audio Advice Live is the only premier high end audio and video show where you can experience it all. Meet face to face with the industry's top experts, brands, and influencers, and hear all the latest and greatest gear live and in person. Audio Advice Live. We'll see you there this August. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan with Audio Advice. Welcome back to a special edition of our monthly live streams. We're super excited to have a couple of our great friends and an incredible brand partner uh, from Clips. We've got Mark and Vlad, who I'll introduce to you two here in just a minute. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And Leon, great to have you back from all of those uh, fishing trips and all that good stuff. Hopefully you're- Yes, it's good to be back. I'm well rested. Well rested and ready to go. So- Let's roll, right, Stephen? Thank you guys, everyone, for joining us. Let us know where it is that you're joining us from. It's always great to see folks from all over the country and even all over the world. Uh, here's what we, you can expect in the next hour. We're going to introduce our, our good friends. We're going to tell you guys what it is that we're giving away, which will also introduce a great new uh, Pulse line from Clips that they're going to tell us about. We're going to talk a little bit about Audio Advice Live and what you can expect to see at Audio Advice Live from our good friends at Clips. And then any questions you have related to two-channel audio, uh, to Klipsch in general. Uh, obviously, home theater is also on the table for anybody that has questions for that. If you've got a question, put it in the chat. We can see these coming across both Audio Advice's YouTube and Facebook, as well as Klipsch's YouTube and Facebook. So lots of great ways to, to submit a question. For best question, our good friends at Klipsch have uh, been kind enough to, to donate a pair of the brand new RP600Ms, which Ooh. are awesome. Amazing. Those Sound are good. Great. We'll tell us about those and what's different in that model, the new model versus uh, its predecessor. So lots to expect. And then we'll, we'll do some great giveaways here at the end. So again, welcome. It is a happy hour. So cheers, everyone. Let us know again if you've got something that you want to share that you're drinking, if you've got some good ideas. My grocery store finally had the uh, Bells Oberon back in stock. So with that, let's, uh, let's start with you, Mark. Mark, if you don't mind, introduce yourself to everybody what it is that you do uh, at the amazing company called Clip. And just for fun. Uh, with you, what is the next concert you're going to go see? Oh, a great way to get started. So welcome. All right. Great to be here. Thank you, Leon and Jonathan, as always. And good to have Vlad with us, of course, today. Uh, my name is Mark Casvan. I've been with Klipsch uh, going into my 32nd year. Uh, I started when I was 12. So you know. <laughs> <There>. um, <laughs> right Leon. now, uh, currently, I'm uh, SVP of uh, a couple roles, brand development and uh, product development. So I'm working on some new ventures, but then also have my hands in product development. And really, uh, Vlad is my key guy as director of product development. So it's just been a blast working with him. He, he has an interesting background with the company, but he's passionate too. So it, this is going to be fun talking about the products today. Uh, today, oh, oh yeah, uh, we're having a little happy hour. But next concert, you asked, Jonathan? Yes. So the next concert I aspire to is I have a favorite place here in Indianapolis called the Jazz Kitchen. I've seen some of my favorite world-class drummers uh, in, I'm telling you, the guys, the, the top shelf guys, Dave Weckl, Steve Smith. Um, so I would love to get there with Ann my wife to see a very powerful jazz fusion performance in close proximity. I, I, I've always used it as almost really kind of a voicing reference, hearing that kind of music live and knowing it well. So that is what I'm looking forward to. Very cool. I know you're a big drummer yourself, right? If I'm not mistaken. No, uh, I dabble with it. Dabble a little bit. Dabble <laughs> yeah. just a little bit. Uh, and you get some good, some good love out there from the, from everyone on your audio advice shirt, which we appreciate you representing. Love the, this shirt. Uh, the original Audio Vice logo from 1978, right, Leon? That's right. You, you brought it out of the vault wow. and they're uh, putting right some, put it back to good use. So thanks yeah. for representing that. Um, very <laughs> well, cool. Mark, Mark's already introduced me, but I, I'm, I'm Vlad, Director of Product Development at Klipsch. I do have a, a, a fun history. I got my foot in the door at Klipsch doing earphones. And then in that then eventually transpired to mm -hmm. sound bars and powered monitors and like all of these new categories that are that we're a part of. But a Klipsch system has been part of my life for well before I worked at Klipsch. Whether it was ProMedia 5.1 when I was in high school, 
all the way to when I bought my first home and before purchasing any furniture, I, I sprung uh, for a reference system. That was with five inch floor standing speakers and an RW10D subwoofer, which I still have somewhere in this house in yeah. the basement. You, you can always use an extra subwoofer, right, Mark? Yeah, I oh, think yeah. when in doubt, a subwoofer does you some good. Uh, yeah, so now I'm, I've been vehemently a part of product development start to finish on passive speakers, subwoofers, sound bars, a little bit of everything. And this is a, a really, really exciting line for us, obviously, is it's uh, the stronghold of what it is to be Klipsch, with the exception of the heritage products, of course. Right. And uh, what is it that you are drinking this fun happy hour? Uh, what's interesting, you have a Michigan beer and yeah. you're currently not in Michigan That's and right. I'm in Michigan drinking an Indiana beer. So <laughs> this is something that I absolutely fell in love with in Indiana. Three Floyd's Brewery. They have Zombie Dust and Gumball Head, which are the two most typically available beers. Um, and they just recently expanded their distribution to Michigan. So this was very purchased cool. in Michigan, and I'm very excited to take a little piece of Indiana with me. Very cool. And where are you in Michigan joining us from tonight? Uh, Wixom, Michigan, which is the suburbs of Detroit. And on your other question, which is the next concert to see, I'm going to steal a little bit of Mark's thunder and say, there's a place downtown in uh, Detroit that's called Cliff Bell's. And that was my first introduction to live jazz, and I fell in love with it immediately. So now Mark knows why the Wi-Fi for engineering in the Indiana office is called Cliff Bells, because uh, oh. when we redid, redid all our Wi-Fi, that's that's one of like the little things that you now know uh, about our Clips headquarters is uh, lots of music venues. Um, that's what we name all our conference rooms after. That's cool. Cliff Bells Very had cool. to be a little piece I left behind in that building. Very nice. Aaron said he's waving from uh, from the UP up there. In the yeah, and I've got uh, Glenn from Allen Park and John Thompson saying uh, Cliff Bells is good. So, yeah, clearly not the only one that thinks that place is awesome. Good validation. Very cool. Thanks again for joining us. Leon, welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be back. So everybody probably knows I started this uh, great company, I don't know. It's too old. Yeah, I was two when we started. <laughs> Fair. In 1978. And uh, I'm in honor of Audio Advice Live because I usually have an Asheville beer. I've got a local Raleigh beer from Brewery Bravana, an IPA. And uh, it's quite tasty, I must say. And I, my next concert will be Roger Waters during Audio Advice Live. That's right. Very be cool. awesome. Thursday night. Uh, wow. On the 18th, right before Audio Advice Live kicks yep. off, Roger was kind enough to come in town for the show, right? To, to get us all ready for great sound. <laughs> it's all kicked off. Oh awesome. Very, That's very awesome. cool. Uh, I am going to be going to Dave Matthews on Friday night here in Raleigh, which we're excited about. And then nice. shortly thereafter, actually going to see uh, One Republic and a band called Need to Breathe open for them, which I'm a big fan of. So there's a couple of couple cool shows that we're excited to go see here real soon. And again, I'm drinking the Bells Oberon from uh, Comstock, Michigan, which is right outside of Kalamazoo, which is where I spent sort of my elementary school, middle school years. So near and dear uh, to my heart now as an adult, obviously. <laughs> I'm like, elementary school? That might yeah. be a little early for... Right. For when I go year. back every now and then to see my friends, it's a, you know, obviously it's a great meetup spot. Um, Cheers to audio advice. Thank you, guys. Thank you again. Thank Cheers, you. everyone, for joining us again. It's great to be back. Uh, this is, these are always a ton of fun, and it's great to see so many familiar names and, and familiar faces or familiar handles, I guess you would say, instead of faces uh, while coming back and asking lots of great questions. So we'll get through as many as we can. For any questions that we aren't able to get to in the next 51 minutes, we'll go back and answer as many of those as we can in the comments. So keep, keep uh, those questions coming. Uh, Mark, we'll, we'll kind of go back to you. I'm sure most folks who are here uh, probably have some familiarity with, with Klipsch. But maybe for those who don't, or maybe they don't know the full story about Klipsch, maybe you can share a little bit about that to, uh, to kick us off. Right, right. Klipsch, Klipsch and Associates, Klipsch Inc., now part of a premium audio company. Klipsch is a founding company of the hi-fi industry. So what does that mean? When the, fa when the uh, early days of the hi-fi industry really started, which was really in the early 40s, Paul Klipsch was right there as a hobbyist, as a passionate musician and engineer. So he invented this uh, amazing product that we still make 76 plus years, the Klipsch horn. 
So he really utilized horn loaded designs because of high efficiency, low distortion. This is the formula for great clips performance. The, the result in uh, just about every clips comparable product is broad dynamic range, dynamic range where music comes to life, music and movies, by the way. So uh, our design philosophy, he established for us and we hold true to it. He lived a very long life, by the way, Paul Klipsch. Uh, if you are curious about him and his personality and you really want to try to get to know him a little bit, do a YouTube search and search PWK interview, a good friend, uh, captured some really priceless footage of Paul Klipsch in 1989 and 1990 in Hope, Arkansas, really capturing his fantastic, funny personality. Such a brilliant, brilliant guy. And Leon, you and I have talked about this many times. It, it, Paul Klipsch, uh, you know, the early days when I was a, a Klipsch dealer in Florida, we had a sticker for the storefront and it said Klipsch, a legend in sound. And, and that sticker was always, to me, it meant, yes, the company, the products are legendary, the heritage products, the Klipsch horn, La Scala, all of these products are legendary. But the man himself, Paul Klipsch, really is the, a legend in sound. His approach to powerful, low distortion, alive dynamic sound reproduction puts Klipsch in a unique category. Klipsch sounds different than most every product on the market. And when you listen to Klipsch and listen to something else, you will hear a distinct difference. You will like one or the other. It's not a mystery. You don't have to be a, an ardent art audiophile. You can be just somebody who loves music and you will hear the difference with Klipsch. So that's the short version, Jonathan. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. And then I know maybe we can start talking a little about a little bit. What, the last sort of big project that Paul was involved in um, and maybe how we can see that yeah. manifested today. Yep. So he, I mentioned he lived a long life. He lived to the age of 98 years old. Uh, he passed away in 2002. And many years uh, working with him, I had the pleasure to work uh, alongside him, along with Roy Delgado, Paul Jacobs, uh, you know, with product development. His late term projects were really pursuing his last uh, dream uh, for the evolution of the Klipsch horn. So it, as everyone may know, the Klipsch horn is a fully horn-loaded 15-inch three-way design that fits in the corner of your room. His dream was to take it to a two-way design. And one of the challenges was having really broad bandwidth, having a horn that really covered a very large portion of the audio spectrum, and that reached down to the lowest frequencies where the low-frequency horn could do the rest. So extraordinary materials and uh, crafts ship, I would say, uh, in these compression drivers were made possible in the 21st century. So now we have these materials to make the Jubilee. The Jubilee is uh, an anniversary product. We intended for 75th anniversary, but we're now re releasing it now. And uh, it's an extraordinary two-way product. Uh, it actually has dual 12-inch drivers in a base reflex enclosure mounted in a Tractrix folded woofer horn. And then on top, it's, it has a large Tractrix uh, mid-range high-frequency driver horn. And it's extraordinary. It has a, uh, an active crossover. It's with, buyout. Yeah. And, and it makes it easy, Leon, for your customers to integrate amplifiers that may have different character. You, you have a couple knobs, one for the high frequency section, one for the low frequency section. You can take a tube amp on the high end. You can put solid state on the bottom. You balance them and you're done. Everything inside the active crossover is DSP controlled. So time alignment, precision in crossover control and um, just everything that's related to the handoff between the drivers. It's absolutely a 21st century product with Paul Klipsch's design principles at heart. It is the new flagship. It's the top of the line in the heritage line. And the pair with the crossover is gonna be around $35,000. And I will add that if anybody has a little sticker shock from that, there are products that are six figures that cannot do what the jubilee can do okay so there it is yeah very cool so we had the opportunity to see this a couple different times but most recently i believe this was at um, expona back in april which was really cool so just for context here's a picture of me i'm you know 5'10, 
Uh, and these obviously are taller and much, much larger than I am. So, I mean, they're incredible size, but the way that these sound, I mean, you can obviously speak to it, uh, Mark, just incredible, which is just amazing to see. We'll put up a couple other photos of, of those as well. Well, there are a couple of things that these do that defy what loudspeaker performance has been able to do, what has been possible in all these decades in the hi-fi industry. Two things, basically unlimited dynamic range and the entire audio spectrum to beyond the low end where it's a feeling, okay? So we're talking below 20 Hertz effortlessly and way beyond 20 kilohertz. And then of course, the dynamic range that really goes into concert levels beyond 120 decibels, but I would say effortlessly and without distortion, that is the key. And you don't have to use kilowatts to do it. You don't have to use thousands of watts of power. You can use, you know, within a hundred watts and still get amazing dynamic range. The sensitivity of these things is above the clip horn and the clip horns right around 106 decibels. So you can do the math there and, and realize these things are, they do extraordinary things effortlessly. That's the key word effortlessly. Um, that's, that's when you, you're not reminded you're listening to a sound system. It, you close your eyes and it transports you to that live performance. So it, there's so much fun. That's the, if anybody remembers this word, it's fun. It gets back to why we love music. Yeah, there are tons of fun to listen to. And one of the things I'll share with everyone, if you had the chance to make it to Audio Advice Live, what's going to be really cool, obviously, Clips is going to be bringing those to Audio Advice Live. And we're actually going to be using these. You're going to be able to listen to them the entire weekend. But we've got a couple of really special use cases where we're going to be using these for the actually for the PA system. We're going to have a big keynote kickoff on Friday night. And then during Saturday and Sunday, we'll have a couple of different panel sessions as well. But we're going to be using this for the audio to fill this entire large ballroom that'll seat you know hundreds of folks. So it'll be really cool. And then whenever not, we're not using them for the um, for any of these content sessions, again, you know, I'm sure Roy and you know Mark and everybody else from the team is just gonna be playing music, bringing folks in, checking them yeah. out, able to hear them in such a you know large room to really feel uh, that you, you just how immersive they are. I'm glad you mentioned Roy, Jonathan, because Roy Delgado is really uh, Paul Klipsch's protege. He really is honoring all the wishes of Paul Klipsch in all of these latest iterations of the heritage models, the Mark IVs, steep, steep um, slope networks, you know, precision driver matching, effortless transition between drivers. Somebody mentioned uh, how, how do the uh, crossovers affect the sound? They don't, that's the thing. They're, they're way over sampling, super high resolution DACs. Uh, they get absolutely out of the way. That's why the crossover is so important and included in the system. So I, there are a lot of great questions. Uh, I, I wish we had two hours. <laughs> That's right. We'll get through this music. Sure. Kevin asked, I think, you know, are these, these, aren't the, uh, these aren't specifically corner horns, the Jubilees, though. Correct? No, they don't require the corner. Corner loading always helps, but uh, they are designed to work in any pretty much space uh, against a wall. Mm -hmm. What's the smallest room you've had them in that you'd be happy at with Mark? Just out of curiosity. We covered this actually in the listening lounge with Roy. He said that a real world room, if you had a 15 by 20, something like that, no problem. Uh, I, he said if, if they fit in the room, um, they'll function properly because they're so clean and non-fatiguing. They're so yeah. embracing. And that's where I think it's not intuitive for some people when they see a large horn um, he, he made an interesting comment. He said, the smaller the room, the larger the horn needs to be to prevent interaction with the room. Isn't that interesting, Leon? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that makes Isn't sense. Isn't interesting? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so he, he said that, and I was like, that's interesting because what they do is when you have a small room, the, the, the sidewalls are closer. The that's room true. interacts, that's right? right? So you just want to minimize room interaction and the first arrival, getting to your ears first, you'll always have a subsequent reflection. But with that first arrival, that Haas effect, it's going to transport you to the acoustics of the performance. That's where it's going to take your brain and the illusion, and it's going to knock down the walls in your room. And that's what a great system will do. And that's what these do, even in this small, real-world room. Very, very cool. Well, for those who maybe you're joining a little bit late, uh, thanks for joining us. And we are uh, excited to have everybody. We're going to cover a lot, as many questions as we can here in the next little while. Um, but you're probably joining because you want to hear a little bit more about what we're giving away. So Vlad, I'll come back to you to talk a little bit about what it is that we're giving away today. And then of course, I'm sure people have lots of new questions around uh, this new product line that you have. Yeah, we're giving away a pretty cool system. 
uh, <clears throat> we've got pull it up <laughs> as there the main go. giveaway prize the basically an RP six thousand F tower <laughs> system. So that's a pair of six thousand F towers. That's an RP five hundred C center channel and a pair of RP five hundred two S surrounds. Which, uh, with the exception of the towers is the exact system that I have in my home and something that I actually, <laughs> I downsized from eight inch floor standards to smaller six inch bookshelves or six and a half inch bookshelves. And these six inch, six and a half inch towers will, will do a phenomenal job. You gotta keep in mind that, you know, the space that you have, you gotta give the, the speakers a little bit of room to breathe. So that's one thing that I really love about these 6,000 Fs is the fitment capability and where you're sitting on the couch and the position of the tweeter in reference to your ear is like perfect. And it matches up really well with this dual, the, this 500C center channel, which is awesome. Tonality is perfect. Keep in mind center channel, 90% of what you watch is coming out of that center channel. So right. it's a hundred percent key to you have that dialed in. And this thing's small, you can put it anywhere. I have um, BDI furniture. Mm -hmm. I've had it for a very, very long time. And they have like a, a pullout sh shelf for a center channel. And this thing fits perfectly inside of it, tucks in, you don't know that it exists. TV mounted on the wall, you have an awesome little system that's predominantly hidden and it sounds super, super natural. Yeah, amazing giveaway, you know, just under $3,000 value, which is huge. Folks are super excited about it. Maybe you can share, I'm sure you, I know you were uh, very, very involved in the new Reference Premiere 2 uh, lineup. Maybe you can share a little bit about what went into the thought process behind the new lineup and then maybe some things that really stand out from from the, the predecessor. Yeah, I, I'd like to say, you know, someone that's had Reference and Reference Premiere in my house for I mean, well over a decade going through the different generations. <clears throat> Reference Premiere, this last generation was almost perfect. Like it left definitely some things on the table as far as just minor improvements and evolution that would just take it far and above where that current speaker exists at. So that was really the, the main focus and purpose of this Reference Premiere Mark II was make those subtle changes and refinements to get the most out of an already really good thing. I mean, it's a, already a phenomenal speaker. I think one of the questions um, that I saw posted earlier is, hey, I already have RP600Ms. Like, what went into improving something that I feel is nearly perfect? And we agree that nearly perfect was the perfect description because to make them perfect, there was a series of things that we wanted to do. And that goes into really like the three to four key changes that you see across the line with Reference Premiere. One, updated woofer designs where we added Faraday shorting rings into the woofers so they can better keep up with the tweeters. Two, enhanced cabinet bracing throughout. So the entire line is just less resonant, it's more dead. It's, it's more of that sound that we want getting to you. Three is the bigger horns. So we took a step up in the waveguide horn design that we have um, on every one of the speakers. So they, they took one step up. And what the effect of that is, um, while it's measurable, you know, you're gonna have to combine several different measurements in order to understand what you're getting. The listening effect is like you just went from a four by three television to widescreen. Now, all of a sudden now sounds exist outside of the speakers. They're less, um, you know, when you close your eyes, you have a more consistent sound stage, better image. And that's the type of stuff uh, that takes you from the type of speaker and at the type of price reference premiere is to really competing with the super hi-fi stuff, the super hi-fi gear. And the last, last change is uh, refined industrial design. We, we already like the way these speakers look. We, mm -hmm. we have since their inception, but a few minor tweaks made a significant improvement. So instead of the chamfers on the front panel tapering down to a point, now they're just flat chamfers on left and right. So that just makes it look a little slimmer in your room. Uh, you'll also notice that on the back, the input, area is 
uh, flush to the surface. That means for anybody that swaps in and out in gear, it's easier to do. There's a new little binding straps on the back there. It makes Dolby Atmos connections a heck of a lot easier, seeing as most people are upgrading to Dolby Atmos after a certain point, you know, of experiencing their speakers. And I think Mark and I, we've we've had Dolby on the horn and we've done a live session with them and we love what Dolby Atmos does now with a very capable system. So tried to explain to somebody how Dolby Atmos works and you know its impact in movie theaters and how that translates really well into the home. So as an example, prior to Dolby Atmos, you'd have, you know, in a 200 person amphitheater, you'd have 10 speakers on the right, 10 speakers on the left, a bunch across the front and some across the back. You'd have to send that left surround or right surround channel to all 10 speakers on the right hand side. But now the experience is it can go from individual speaker to speaker to speaker to speaker and actually move across the auditorium in three dimensions. Now you get to take that exact same experience home, whether it's with Klipsch Dolby Atmos soundbars or, or a reference premiere system. So for anyone that hasn't experienced it, I highly recommend it because it's super flexible. You can start with something just, you know, putting a couple of up firing drivers on top of your existing reference premiere system and then eventually grow into a bigger audio video receiver, putting some speakers into the ceiling, maybe adding some rear surrounds and all of that enhances that experience. And also, I mean, your streaming content is all coming through that way. And um, that's something Klipsch has always excelled at. We've, we've been one of the favorites of Dolby to showcasing that technology because of control directivity. And that's the same with this new reference premiere line. We, we really have those big horns, still have control directivity. Um, sound is just um, in a bigger sound stage. So that's in, a, in the gist of it, what reference premiere Mark II represents. Evolution, refinement, True hi-fi. Yeah, very cool. Great details. Some folks are mentioning that they, they actually may be new to Clips. Leon, uh, you know, going back just a couple of years, I remember seeing your expression on your face when you heard the RP600Ms, I believe it was, for the first time. And yeah, they were really amazing. Yeah, yeah, so maybe yeah. you can share a little bit about, you know, kind of what that experience was like for you personally. You know, obviously growing up in hi-fi for a long period of time. And then uh, if you guys want to maybe share a little bit more about what's different in the new uh, RP600M2s. So, Leon. Yeah. Well, the new ones, which I listened to today, um, they, they disappear even more. You know, that having that driver go all the way to the edge of the cabinet, it, the speaker is just gone. And uh, Mark, you know, we were talking about that it goes lower mm -hmm. in frequency response now. And it's just so effortless. It's just amazing how that, and the, you, paint, you shut your eyes and even open, you can't point to the speaker. It's just incredible how the sound stage it presents. And of course, with the high sensitivity, you have that live sound that sounds like music really sounds. Uh, so there, I try those in the new 8000s today and just blown away. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and we, thank you, we did some refining. It means a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. And that's exactly what I, I meant to convey is when you close your eyes you just have no idea where those yeah, the speaker are. especially the 8000s i mean they were gone they're just yeah. vanished yeah you should and be listening to the we, instruments you know, and the musicians you brought up you a great point we take for granted because we've been around dolby atmos since what 2014 but we forget that most people have it and that experience is just so far beyond what anyone's ever had with regular dolby it's incredible yeah, yeah, I think the RP six hundred M's at their retail price of seven forty nine for the pair are arguably the best bang for the buck because you're getting something in one box with a pair of speakers. It's under a thousand bucks. They're pretty good at reproducing music without the need of a subwoofer, start to finish. Yeah, they go so, deep. They, I mean, they they don't go as deep as full range, but they go deep enough for that price range to really make right. you feel like you're there, and that's what it's about is feeling like you're there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something that we did keep with Reference Premiere Mark II, that, that sound signature that people love. 
that was, I think, that was really important for you, Mark, when we were doing um, tests of the RP8000F versus the second generation. We started messing around with bifurcated cabinets. So now all of the floor standing speakers have individual cabinet volumes for their base drivers. And with that, had we had to kind of rethink uh, the way that our base performance is, essentially. We, <clears throat> we damped the speaker to a certain degree where it just stopped sounding like clips. And yeah. that's this, that slam factor, that full range yeah. sound, that yeah. ability to you know, make you want to tap your foot was missing in the first versions. And we yeah. sort of had to yeah. rethink and dial it back. Well, I'll tell you what happens, Leon and Jonathan. You guys will find this interesting. Uh, when Chris Perrins, for example, is looking at a next gen product, he's a perfectionist and he carries that torch, I think, from Paul Klipsch and <coughs> just like Roy Delgado. And these guys, they, they, they will let the pendulum swing. And then if it swings too far, we'll have a listening session. And then we'll say, well, that's good. However, we want the slam factor with that tight, deep, damped base. So we want the articulation, but we want the extension and we want the feeling. We want it all. So we need to do this. And we're, we're not going to tell you everything we did right inside the cabinet. But let, let me just say that there was lots of listening while these tweaks and adjustments were made. Uh, because we, we do know our customers pretty well, uh, what they expect out of this line. And then uh, the comment, Leon, that you made of, man, that the last generation was so good. Um, we, we often had the conversation in the building of if it's not broken, let's not fix it. OK, however, however, in the pursuit of what Paul Klipsch really set out for us as ongoing goals, always this constant improvement, constant refinement. That's exactly what we did with the RP Mark II. Refinement, lower distortion, more open, more revealing, if you will. And uh, we did that with this new line without sacrificing the really great qualities already therein, already within this product. So we knew, Leon, we would be having this conversation with you and we're having it live <laughs> the morning this morning you listened to it and here we are speaking in front of the world about your feelings about it. And uh, it makes, it really warms my heart that you, you like what you hear because our, we spent a lot of time on this, a lot of time. Well, and there was, was a lot of nitpicky stuff effort. there for sure. In the, in the way that it sounds, especially bass performance, I, I, in, it, a lot of it is not really easy to measure. Like, I remember, Mark, you and I were staring at, at frequency response graphs and we're like, OK, I'm hearing this and both of these measure exactly the, the same way. So there's there's still a little bit of that black art to do. This is the final experience. measurement. Yeah, the ears measurement. are the final measurement right tool. Here. <laughs> yeah, arguably the first. Um, I mean, yeah. that's our, our usual approach. And I think, Mark, you taught me this is we're going to listen to them and then we're going to look at any measurements. You don't want to color your expectations by looking at a measurement of a speaker and then making a decision as to whether you're going to like it or not. Because well, you don't yeah. know, you can't correlate what you like the sound of to a frequency response measurement, which mm -hmm. I know makes the buying decision very hard for all the folks that are listening um, because you try to justify a rationale for why I picked this speaker over this speaker and leaning on a measurement or a specification is absolutely not the right way to do it because maybe you'll convince yourself that you found something that you really like because you saw on a frequency response graph how flat it was or how broadband it is or how, how sensitive it is. You got to hear it. You really got to experience it. Hopefully, in answering some of your questions, we can help you get to a place where you're more confident and comfortable in the way that the speaker performs. But we regularly do competitive listening to many speakers that are much more expensive than Klipsch. Um, namely, like, let's take the RP600M. You know, of course, we had to listen to speakers that are twice, three times, four times the price. And the price doesn't really correlate to performance after a certain point. You get to a, a law of diminishing returns, and then you get a, get to a point where 
you just have a preference. And Klipsch has always served into that preference of this is fun. This is enjoyable to listen to. And that's priority one. Everything else is secondary beyond customer experience. And I think that's why we've been really, really successful in this audio industry. Yeah. One other thing we wanted to point out for Jonathan and the sales team, uh, of course, with Leon leading the charge there is that to make it easy to sell the line, um, in other words, and e easier for your customers to understand the line, uh, basically they all scale. They all have a similar approach in their sonic uh, uh, character. And, and when I say that, I don't mean that they color the sound, they are neutral, but they scale from the 500 M's to the 600 M's to the 5,000, 6,000, 8,000s and RF7s, I might add. RF7s share a lot of the inherent technology that's in this new RP Mark II line. So it all scales. It's basically your room size and your power levels and your dynamic range levels. What do you want to achieve in your given room? So it's pretty easy to tell that story. I mean, if you sit down and you listen to RF7s or 8,000s and you get that wow factor, that holy cannoli factor, <laughs> Then you can decide, well, what do I need for my house? And then here's the beauty of it also. Audio video receivers today will drive these things effortlessly. So if you're putting together a home theater system, the amplifier power that's in these modern AVRs will drive these, okay? The Klipsch because of their higher sensitivity. And then, of course, if you want to step to separate amplifiers, which we do encourage, which is what I have back there or there, <laughs> a rack of amplifiers with a processor because your dynamic range levels go up even higher. It's just almost limitless with this line. And the reference premiere represent modern, easy to live with, really aesthetically pleasing, slim products that deliver the goods. They deliver the promise of the Klipsch brand, the big sound, which of course, you know, from the heritage line, but that's what RPs do. They deliver that big effortless sound, but easier to live with slim and elegant and attractive. Oh, I could go on and on about this stuff. I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe not, not to add to the point too much, but I, I couldn't agree more on just the, like I'm a big data guy, big science guy, but just in terms of, you know, balancing the art with the science and Vlad, I think he's, you know, he spoke to it very, very well. All of you guys did. Uh, in terms of, you know, you just can't, you can't trick your ear. It's it ultimately, it's like, what are you hearing and how's it here to you? Cause it's hard to, to measure things like timber and tonality and those kinds of things. Right. Um, so yeah, can't impress that enough. I think Matt Summers had a great quote from Paul Klipsch as well, uh, that he posted in the comments, um, real quick question, sort of a technical question. What is biamping? Leon, maybe you want to start off with this one. It's a great question. We'll post a great video that we have, but, but Leon, your, your, uh, maybe quick summary of that. Well, the, the Jubilee is going to be active biamping, where you're going to have an active crossover that's going to take your input from your preamp and split it <clears throat> with the right slope and frequency to send the high frequencies to the top horn and the bottom to the woofer cabinet. So that's active biamping with two amplifiers. Um, and I think that's that, that's really what biamping is about. You can passively biamp some speakers if you've got dual connections. I don't think that's worth the money to do. Um, yeah, I'd rather buy better speakers, but, um, these are actively by amp speakers, which will make them just so open. I can't wait to hear them. Yeah. And you know what Mark mentioned in today's day and age, virtually every audio video receiver is able to drive everything in our line. So, um, you, you don't have to worry about not having enough power in this instance. Uh, so you don't have to use it. Yep. Very cool. Uh, we'll see. Vlad, you had a question you wanted to um, discuss, I think from Russell. Yeah. Yeah. Russell's question was, uh, are there wattage constraints or I guess energy constraints from your typical AV receiver that you need to consider when designing and building speakers? Well, inherently with the high efficiency that Klipsch provides, we haven't had to worry about that in a long time, honestly. But with the receivers that are available today, Class D amplifiers, they do everything that they're supposed to. They're providing you at least 80 watts of power. Depends on your room size. But really, in most of our living rooms, I mean, we're talking about 17 by 17, maybe 9-foot ceiling. No, no, you don't have to worry about it. Find something that you like 
something that you like the interface of that has all of the connections that you need with no more and, and do it. And you'll find out for yourself really quickly that even with some of the smallest speakers that we have, let's take, if I was taking five inch bookshelves and those were going to be my main left and right speakers and a subwoofer to go with it, which by the way, that subwoofer is going to have an amplifier. Um, you're going to be able to run that room with just about everything that's available in the market today with RP 500 M's. Now you go to a bigger speaker, it can, it's more dynamic. It could deliver more. You're going to need even less power, just like you see with Clipshorn, Jubilee, et cetera. I mean, if we're just going from five inch bookshelves, to eight inch floor standing speakers, you'll notice that the difference is rather vast in how much you need to drive that eight inch floor. So the more you spend on your speakers, the less power you ultimately need to, to drive them. Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my real life well, experience. It's and, funny. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? The bigger yeah. the speakers, the less power you need. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what? No, no, that's with Klipsch. That's with Klipsch because they have mm -hmm. higher sensitivity the larger they get. Absolutely. I yeah, would just say right, this, right. keep your power and add a little more because what that will result in is dynamic range that's going to get a little crazy and fun. I, if you like your movies loud, if you like to feel them, if you like to crank your music and not worry about your speakers blowing up, clips are for you. And I will add this, the new gen, Leon, if you haven't noticed this, but they, they taunt you to turn them up louder because they're so clean. What happens with most systems is when you turn them up to a certain volume, your ears are like, mm, I think they're running out of gas. Something's letting go. It could be the amp, could be the speakers, could be both. We've all heard that in a car stereo, right? Oh, turn that, turn that oh, down. Yeah. Please turn that down. However, with this product line, they will taunt you to turn it up to levels that maybe you haven't achieved before because it's so clean. And that is what's fun about this new line, for sure. Yes. <clears throat> Very cool. I'll so, make uh, a comment on the receiver, though. Yeah. So the, the only catch is, Typically, as you go up in receiver levels, they get better DACs in them, so they actually do sound better. Mm -hmm. So you have to consider that when you're, you know, your whole plan of things. Right. There's also something to be said to the higher end receivers having some higher end features that are really worthwhile. Like room um, correction. Like good room correction. Yeah. Almost every receiver has some amount of room correction, but... But Dirac is really good. Is, yes, specifically. Once you take that step to Dirac and being able to then customize beyond what the room correction provides you, like in Dirac, Dirac, you're able to then give it a new target curve. Let's say you want to mess around with what your speakers sound like in your room. You could do that across the entire range with, with Dirac. So yes, agreed. And similarly, if you have an outdated old receiver, it's worth taking that step up just from HDMI eARC and supporting Dolby Atmos. Dolby Atmos, yeah. I mean, e beyond Dolby Atmos, there's there's so much more to the decoding that happens, the functionality that you have, the ease of use. Uh, yeah, so there there is definitely more to getting a, a nicer um, ABR. Very cool. Uh, I think hopefully I said this right. Javi asked basically what would Paul Klipsch think about the new RP2 lineup? And maybe you already know the answer because I know you have sort of these traditional, I don't call them traditional, these um, critical design pillars that maybe you could talk about, right? So, so you kind of already know the answer because you're staying true to those those uh, pillars, right? So what are those pillars? The, the four design principles. I covered a couple of them. High efficiency, mm -hmm. dynamic range. It's an inverse relationship. The lower the sensitivity of a system inherently, the harder it's going to have to work. And that means more inherent distortion. And with speakers, that's modulation distortion. You know, if a driver moves, that's what Paul Cliff would say. If a driver moves, it's going to distort. So our objective is let's move the air with less effort. That includes horn loaded drivers. It includes very well-designed base reflex enclosures, base alignments. Uh, that includes into our subwoofers. We have some exciting news coming on later this year, but um, high efficiency, low distortion, very important inverse relationship. That formula is really what Paul Klipsch discovered early on. 
And then the result being fantastic dynamic range. And that's where this is objective. This is not so subjective. This is objective that the dynamic output you can get from clip systems is just greater than what is physically possible with other systems that have less sensitivity and require more amplifier power. You know, there are two ways to reduce distortion. That's let your amplifier just run cool and collected and not strain. Lots of dynamic headroom available. And same with your speakers, dynamic headroom. Let that dynamic headroom be there so that when instantaneous impact comes in your movie soundtrack, it reproduces it. And you're not reminded it's a system. It's not distorting. You're just love in the movie you forget where you are and then there are two others control directivity that is a result of our horn, horn loaded design and <laughs> you guys are talking about room correction but i submit that if you have a clips horn loaded system with control directivity you've already had stage one of room correction because by controlling the distribution into your listening area and not allowing reflections you're actually minimizing the effects of your room right out of the gate with clips and controlled activity. And then if you add to that with the Dirac, for instance, for instance, that will take it to another level. Uh, so controlled activity is very important for that sound stage, that live presence and taking to taking you to the venue. And what that means is taking you to the acoustic space of the performance or the movie soundtrack. And then the last one is flat frequency response. Everybody talks about flat frequency response. We all want flat, neutral response, uh, absolute bandwidth balance, audio spectrum, smooth, equal weight, equal presence at all frequencies. In an anechoic chamber, in the test chamber, and if anyone does come to Indianapolis and they want a nickel tour, I'd be happy to give them one. Uh, I saw that in the comments. But when you are in an anechoic chamber, this is an environment that does not exist in nature, but we use it as a sterile environment to know exactly what the loudspeaker is doing within its entire polar response. This tells us about the power response in the real world environment. So the, the frequency response in room. So control directivity is tied to in room frequency response, smooth, natural balance in your room. Some times if you get reflections at certain frequencies that can interfere with your first arrival and it can create jagged response in your room so controlled reactivity and the precision design of our drivers ensures flat smooth frequency response in your listening position in the room so when we say flat frequency response we're talking real world in the real listening environment so that is the final of the four and then uh you know we we have our other uh very important attributes of our products. It relates to architectural, outdoor, reliability. You know, if you're not uh, pounding on your speakers to within an inch of their life, they're going to be more reliable. They're going to last for years, decades even, and they're going to be something you can pass on to your kids. That That is why uh, our heritage products, we hear a lot of people say, hey, my heresies, Las Galas, they sound like the day I bought them 40 years ago. And we love hearing that. That's that's a wonderful thing. If you can make an investment in sound, make an investment in quality audio that will last you a long time. That's actually a really good investment. And one other aspect of Klipsch in particular is we do things so different that in my opinion, I am opinionated on this, but if you invest in Klipsch, you're ahead of the curve for many years to come. I said it, it's out there. <laughs> Very, very cool. Uh, a lot of folks have been asking about, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, power or the electronics, you know, that maybe work well or lend themselves to work well with clips. Vlad, I don't know, maybe Joe actually from Joe and Tells is on. You guys, some of you may have seen. He asked a great question um, on, we'll post it up, about the clips optimized mode. Is that something you can sort of speak to a little bit and, and what that is and what the benefits are? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, I think, you know, we, we're oftentimes talking to ourselves um, when we talk about uh, efficiency, distortion, wide dynamic range, like complex things that make a lot of sense in, in principle. But the reality is a lot of customers are taking home speakers, they're plugging them in, they're running them through whatever room compensation that exists within that audio video receiver. And that's it. And that's their experience. That's their setup. I, I've went to a lot of friends' houses that have asked me, hey, come over and just tweak my setup and, and see if you can get anything more out of it. One of the first things that 
we have to do immediately is set the size of the speakers correctly and figure out the crossover with their subwoofer. And that's really what Klipsch Optimize mode is set to do, is find the right crossover setting for the speaker to a whatever subwoofer you might have available in order to get an optimized experience. Because even some of the highest end room correction systems don't do this right. They set speakers to large instead of small. They don't pick the right crossover point. They don't even start with like what everybody should know. It should go on like a big thing on, on every AVR. Set all speakers to low, set to 80 hertz crossover if you have a subwoofer. Configure from there, essentially. Well, we took it a step further where we actually took measurements of the speakers. We found out where, or at least we put into some of these Onkyo and Integra receivers, um, what the ideal crossover should be to let the speaker do the most amount, amount of work and then transfer everything else over to the sub. So that's, that's Klipsch optimized mode. Um, that's just one assurance point that we can get that when you take it home, you set it up without having to Google anything or go into a forum, you get it right. And it's like 95% of the way there. And I think for most people, that's really what they need. I mean, they don't need to know exactly what EQ they need to set on their speaker to sound razor flat in an anechoic environment. They need to know how to get the best sound out of their system. And I think a lot of folks are missing the boat because we're, it is complicated sometimes. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I'll see is Raphael said every time I demo my fives to my friends or family, they're always so impressed by the sound coming out of those little speakers. I wouldn't call them little, but that's actually what I'm using right now for my, uh, for my desktop speakers. And they're, I love them. I've had them for what, a couple of years now and they're amazing. Right. <clears throat> uh, let's see a couple more questions. I, a couple of folks asked about maybe a sort of a higher uh, topic, higher funnel question about burn in and speaker burn in, and, you know, are these ready to go out of the box? Maybe you guys can just quick thoughts on speaker burn in. And if so, how long, What's the right way to do it? We almost go start with you. Thoughts? I'm not sure. It, it seems like the speakers that are really hard to drive, you got to push them a bit. But I've never experienced that with a high sensitivity speaker. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't think we have a measurable difference. I mean, we we've tried our fair share. There there is, I guess, a certain suspension or certain materials, there are adhesives that are used in the product. And, you know, um, especially when you get to subwoofers, Mark, you could probably talk about it, but those motors need a little bit of movement in order to be consistent rather. Um, yeah, it doesn't take long for a subwoofer to break in. But I would say of all the products, and Leon, you'll appreciate this, would be the clip horn. So the clip horn, when you're really pounding on them, that 15-inch woofer doesn't move much at all because of the high sensitivity. And the compression drivers don't either. Uh, but they are all they are designed um, for you know years of break-in before final measurements and specs are set. And... Um, what happens is when you first open up, let's say heritage product, uh, you know, if you put uh, a week on them, let's say they're going to be, they're going to be well broken in. It, some people talk about crossovers breaking in, but no, not really. Uh, m mostly it's the suspension of maybe the low frequency drivers that they just, you know, they kind of break in a little bit, kind of like when you break in an automobile, you don't just redline it. Uh, right away, you kind of ease into it with the RPMs and, and same with speakers, you know, once once the spiders and the crossovers, I mean, I'm sorry, the surrounds and, and the spiders uh, are, are given a little bit of uh, juice, they're, they're going to be fine. They're going to set to their specs. So it, it's it's something that people may spend a little more time on than they, they should. I, our suggestion is just enjoy your product and then you know, once you've had them for a week or a month, go ahead and, uh, as Vlad says, give them the berries and, and you're going to enjoy uh, that result. Yeah. Yeah. For anyone that's saying that, you know, you got to put 5,000 hours on these things and then the base comes uh, comes out or the tweeter breaks in. I, mostly that's your ears breaking in um, as opposed <laughs> to the speakers. You're getting used to what you're hearing. 
we're very adaptable human beings and uh, a, a change in sound is something that takes time to adjust to potentially. But uh, yeah, that's all there is to it. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Good question though. Thank you for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Time for maybe one or one more or two. So this is a good question. I think for both of you guys, given that you got kind of one, one foot on the brand side, one foot on the product side, uh, you probably can speak to both. This was from Tom. He asked, was there an aha moment when you just knew certain products would capture new audio files in their journey? Example, the RP600M uh, or something like that. Because you guys do a great job of, with heritage appealing to folks who maybe consider themselves audiophiles or been in the industry for a long time. And obviously, you know, you have uh, more affordable folks for folks just getting into this. Is there a product or maybe a category that sticks out to you? I, I think that uh, the compact bookshelf monitors and the reference premiere line have kicked off a category for us of easy to live with, yet no compromise audio quality. And um, you can look at that in the fives, the powered monitors, because they share the driver approach and our philosophy, of course, in a compact loudspeaker. I've had conversations with Steve Guttenberg, who's highly regarded in his YouTube channel and from his days of CNET and Stereophile. And uh, we have conversations in the past where he asked, where would I start to get some real dynamic range out of Klipsch? Comparatively small, but easy to live with. And I just said, start with a driver with a six and a half if you want to, you know, get into that serious business category. And I think that uh, a neat question, Jonathan, earlier was, uh, can, can we use RPs with tube gear? Absolutely. In fact, I love hearing uh, a simple integrated tube amp with the bookshelf monitors in the RP line. They are, they've been showcased at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest as the affordable, fantastic audiophile system. So, you know, the high sensitivity of the speakers combined with the, the musical tube amps is just a wonderful combination. Have a turntable with it, and you're just going to have a very reasonably priced, yet I would say it, audiophile system. So, that is my initial input. Anybody who loves their music, don't get caught up in the technical jargon and the gear. Just get a simple setup and live with, with it. Live with it for a year. And then come back and say, well, my ears have been spoiled and now I won't be the same. I can't listen to that Bluetooth little speaker anymore. I need, <laughs> I need highest fidelity. And, and one thing that Paul Clip said was, it's either fidelity or it's infidelity. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think you covered it, Mark. Like my favorite uh, little speaker, I guess it's not that little, but the RP 600 M simply because I've had to move recently and I've had to take speakers from place to place. And there's certain convenience with the fact that a six and a half inch bookshelf, you can put just about anywhere and it could serve the full purpose of being your main system, uh, like in, in my office is a 10 by 12 room, a pair of 600 M's are more than sufficient to get the job done. Um, and anything bigger, I would argue, starts getting to the point of now you're putting it really close to the corner or up against the wall and you're compromising the sound of the speaker naturally. But the question really was the aha moment. And that was when we put HDMI into an integrated platform that didn't really take any compromises to hit a certain price point. And we put that into a bookshelf speaker. Because if you go back to the founding principles of Paul W. Klipsch and that high efficiency was, is a component of it, the fact is something that has DSP and by amplified actively by amplified inside of the speaker where we're giving just the right amount of power to the, that component is true efficiency. We're closing the loop and controlling the ability of not wasting heat and energy through using passive crossover networks. And that's really like the next step up is having a smart integrated system that can adapt to your room and simply plug into where your content is. I mean, our job is to make it easier and more enjoyable for you to enjoy whatever you already love. And that's what What's great about Klipsch is like, you could be a huge country music fan and 
the RP600M or a set of the fives or maybe a future product that's coming um, <laughs> with slightly larger woofers gets you there. And that was always my experience with Klipsch. Video well, you're, hinting, you're hinting there, Vlad. You're not supposed I to am, do that. I am. I am. You, you might have to go to Audio Advice Live because based on the, the notes I have. Yeah, I think we may have some, new, some there, right? new products there <laughs> that have never been seen before Very cool. by customers. Uh Hey, thanks so much to everyone for joining. These are a ton of fun. They're, they're so much fun just for us, right? It gives us a great opportunity to talk about what we love. And we're just glad folks are along for the ride. And, and thanks for sharing your comments that a lot of you guys are getting a lot of value out of this. We really appreciate it. We, it means a lot to us. Uh, Mark, Vlad, obviously, thank you guys for joining us and for sharing so much of your experience and dropping so much of your knowledge. I know the comments, everybody has, has really, really enjoyed this and nothing but a lot of great positive feedback, which is awesome. Let's give away some cool gear. So our winner for the best question, and before I announce that, again, somebody asked, hey, are we going to go back and post this? And so this uh, will be posted on our YouTube channel, and I think Clips will be posting it on theirs as well. And again, we're going to go back, and I know we are only able to get through as many or so many questions, but we're going to go back and answer as many of those questions as we can in the comments. So we will post this on our YouTube channel. It'll live there so you can go back and uh, look back to this. And um, But our winner for the RP600M2s is... Russell Evans, great question that I think Vlad spoke to uh, for a good little bit there, which is a great question. Thanks for providing that great question, Russell. And thanks everyone for providing all the great questions. Again, uh, lots of great questions, lots of great comments. And then uh, real quick on Thursday, we will be on the Cobas live stream at four o'clock. Ah. So if you want to be sure to join that, we're going to be talking uh, a lot with David Solomon from Cobas about all things audio advice live. We're going to have a lot of our other brand partners on there as well. So if you want to learn more and hear from our, some some of our partners about what it is that we're going to be showing at Audio Vice Live, feel free to tune into that. And then last quick announcement, join us next month, August 11th. We'll be welcoming back Cambridge with their brand new Cambridge Alva V2 of their new turntable, a $2,000 value. Be sure to tune in for that on Thursday, August the 11th. So thanks again for joining everyone. Our winner for today for this incredible new RP2 system uh, almost three thousand dollar value. Let me pull it back up here. Is drum roll, virtual drum roll, please. <laughs> and I will pull up our winner as our certified accountants reveal the name. So it is Albert Voltaire. Hopefully, I get that right. Albert Voltaire from Florida. Thank you for for being part of this. Congratulations. We will be reaching out to you directly uh, to provide that with you. Thanks again, to everyone, for joining us again. We hope to see you. On Thursday, if you can make it. If not, we'll see you uh, next month on our next live stream. And we hope to see as many of you can as we can at Audio Advice Live. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's, it's going to rock. Fun. There's so rock. much cool stuff there. So I can't much wait. Cool stuff. And if you want to get $5 off uh, the registration, there is a great code uh, from Clips, Clips VIP 22 to get five bucks off the registration. So thanks again, everyone. It's been a ton of fun. Have a great evening. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you.